Hello and welcome back to the Healthy Soils for Sustainable Cotton webinar series. Joining us today is David Lamb. Mr. Lamb is the project manager of our Healthy Soils for Sustainable Cotton program at the Soil Health Institute. As project manager, he leads our soil health training and education programs, which seek to increase adoption of soil health management practices among cotton producers. Mr. Lamb came to the Soil Health Institute after 40 years of service with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service. He held, a, he held several positions at NRCS, including District Conservationist at the Fort Wayne Field Office in Indiana, Assistant State Conservationist for Programs in Georgia, and Team Leader for the National Soil Health and Sustainability Team. Mr. Lamb earned his Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources from Ball State University in 1978. In this webinar episode, Mr. Lamb will teach us about planning a soil health management system. He will discuss the key soil health indicators and regenerative systems for soil health. Mr. Lamb will introduce soil health, planning, soil health promoting practices and activities identify which of these are key to developing a soil health management system, and describe their interactions, dependencies, and synergies. He will also offer insight to the potential barriers to implementing a soil health management system. Mr. Lamb, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Camille. It's a nice introduction there. And I wanna welcome everybody to this webinar series uh, for Healthy Soils for Sustainable Cotton. And when we, we designed this series, each webinar is trying to build on the previous one. Uh, up until this point, hopefully you've had an opportunity to hear the presentation, introductory one on soil health, what it is, talking a little bit about you know, soil disturbances and those types of things, introducing those kind of concepts. And then we had an excellent presentation on the linkage between soil biology and soil health and why the biology of the soil is so important. And then another presentation on the planning principles. What are those things that every system can do to improve soil health and function uh, related to uh, food and fiber production? And then we've also had a couple presentations on a more ecological approach to pest management and nutrient management. And this one, I want to really begin the discussion on now that we have this knowledge, how can I start to put together a system that works on my farm? to help me improve uh, its function, related, soil function related to uh, infiltration and so forth, so I can have uh, a sustainable cotton. By the end of this webinar, uh, hopefully you'll be able to walk out and you'll be able to go out and evaluate your own fields and look at those key soil health indicators that you can see and visibly observe in your fields. I wanna talk about the practices. You know, we, There's a lot of things we can do in agriculture, but there's only so many things that you can, activities and practices that can be applied as a system when you're developing your soil health management system. And I want to talk about the importance of the interaction and how these practices, when they're implemented as a system, create this synergy which results in a greater in, in improvement in the soil function uh, on your particular field. And then close out by talking about some challenges that you might see. So when you talk about in doing some kind of an assessment, you know, we're not talking about grabbing a sample and sending it in to a lab. That will come in a follow-up webinar in a few weeks. Really what I want you to do is be able to look at, take your sight, your smell, your touch, and even maybe your taste if you feel like it, and look at your field and do some, some subjective observations. And they can really tell you a lot, uh, and you'd be surprised how close they can uh, give you some indicator of whether you got healthy soils or non-healthy soils. And we're going to be looking at the residue, we're going to look at the soil surface, the profile, plant roots, etc. So let's, let's kind of begin that, that process. You know, first thing you can do is get in your pickup and drive around after a big rain and take a look at your fields. And if your field kind of looks like the one uh, there in the top left corner, it should be probably all right. That means the water is draining through into the soil profile, it's not ponding, uh, it looks like we have a lot of residue there. Those are all indicators that things are working fine. But if your soil is kind of looking like the bottom picture there, where you got big, big ponds, ponding taking place, it looks like uh, water's not getting in where it should be. Or if you're seeing something that looks like this after it dries out, where you got a surface crusting, that's a good indicator that things aren't working the way they should. You know, unfortunately in agriculture, we tend to accept 
conditions the way they are as being the norm rather than questioning why is my water ponding? Why isn't it not soaking in? Why am I getting this surface crusting uh, occurring? Like what, and what can I do to, to uh, eliminate that? So we, we tend to accept that as a norm when it isn't the norm. You know, the, the, the upper picture is really what we should be seeing. You know, we shouldn't be seeing any evidence of surface crusting. I like to show this picture. This is an interesting one of a farm and uh, actually in Kentucky, it's an organic farm. And it's got all the indicators of poor soil function, poor soil health in it. You know, one, the first one is it's light colored. You know, you don't see any, any it's blonde. It's got a real light texture to, or uh, color to it, which tells me things maybe don't have a lot of organic matter. You also see a lot of uh, sediment accumulating. Accumulating, so we've had water movement, we've had it uh, road, erosion take place, and we've had sediment drop out. You can see some tire tracks in there, which means you're seeing some compaction taking place. So in this one picture, we kind of capture all those things I talked about in the previous slide of, of how uh, things that are, are degrading activities related to your soil. Oops, went too fast. Let's talk a little bit about residue. Uh, Surface residue cover, you ought to have about 70, 80, 90%. A lot of people say if you have healthy soils, you shouldn't see your soil at all. Well, what do we mean by that? Uh, it takes a lot of residue to protect the soil surface. You know, in the 1980s, NRCS was mandated to do highly erodible conservation plans, and many of you out there might have had that. Uh, and we kind of set a bar at 30 or 40% of residue cover wherever you were at in the country. Well, that's a pretty low bar and it works if the only thing you're looking at is soil erosion. But if we're wanting to improve soil health, which is way beyond that, includes those functions necessary for food and fiber production, we need to have a lot more residue that, than, than that. Uh, we need to look at the residue. Is it shredded? Is it in small pieces like this? Now, this shredding of these corn stalks didn't take place by a tillage operation. It took place by the microbes or the that are in the soil. There's a lot of uh, arthropods and those types of things that tend to shred the so uh, residue and leave it in smaller pieces that make it more uh, easier for the, micro the microscopic organisms to break it down and incorporate it and convert it into uh, organic matter. And you ought to see organic matter in various stages of decomposition. It shouldn't all be the same. And the other thing you ought to look at, if you're seeing crop residue from two or three of your two or three year old uh, crops, uh, then that's a good indicator that things aren't working as well as they should. Residue should uh, decompose relatively quickly. In fact, healthy soils uh, tend to degrade it very fast and, and have a tendency to lay the surface exposed if you don't manage them properly. Another thing we can do is we can get down our hands and knees and we can brush back that surface residue and look at the soil itself. It should be fine. You see aggregates, nice little crumbs, if you will, look like chocolate cake crumbs. That should be the first indicator. And when you pick one of those up, you ought to be able to crumble it pretty easy. If it's as hard as a brick, yeah, that's a good indicator that things aren't working quite as good. Uh, you ought to have a darker surface, you know, that that's the interface between where the crop residue is, the, whether you have cover crop or last year's commodity crop residue and the soil surface, there should be some decomposition taking place and that organic matter tends to uh, make that surface a little darker. You ought to see signs of uh, uh, surface creatures. Uh, you might see some pill bugs, the good earthworms. I'll talk more about those in, in, in a few minutes. And the other thing, you know, healthy soils tend to be a little spongy. You know, no, that sounds kind of silly, but there's a reason behind that. Again, that, that interface where you have crop residue, you have a cover crop, you have a lot of uh, kind of like a carpet mat, if you will, on top of the soil surface. And the other thing is, as this picture points out, you see a lot of root fibers in there. And those tend to help support the, uh, create structure, create uh, pore space, create, they help create that bounce, if you will. So healthy soils, again, they, they tend to be a little spongy when you walk on them. Now let's talk about compaction. That takes place in a lot of conditions out there. Modern agriculture is notorious for creating compacting layers. How do you go about evaluating that? Well, one thing you can do is get you, this is called a penetrometer. It measures the resistance of the probe as it's going down through the soil profile. And somebody's determined that uh, when you hit a uh, 300 pounds per square inch pressure resistance, uh, roots can't penetrate that. Well, not all of us have a penetrometer, so is there other things that we can use? Yeah, we can take a shovel. 
something that either be a spade or a, a survey flag or even a soil probe and try and push it down through the soil profile. And you should hit a, you know, a healthy soil, you, you should be able to get it in pretty easy. That means you have no restrictive layer for it to have to break through. Those that are degraded have a compacted layer, which is that, you know, you think about modern agriculture, we've, we've gone across much of our, our farmable acreage and created a layer at about six inches that's, that's hard to get through, has greater than 300 pounds of pressure resistance. That's not a, a good thing, you know. And anything, the other thing is when we have deeper tillage, we're starting to use rippers and those types of things to get through that. And all we're doing is pushing that restricted layer deeper into the soil profile. And you need to compare it to someplace outside the field. Look at several locations, you know, across the field. Well, go to a fence row, a wooded area, or somewhere that hasn't been disturbed for a number of years to kind of give you an idea of what it should be. Again, we, we accept degraded conditions as being the norm when they don't have to be. Our roots. What roots tell us about soil health is, is, is really intriguing. Uh, roots are meant to, to grow straight. They should not go crooked, sideways, J-rooted. You know, they're not genetically designed to do that. A root will grow until it hits a restricted layer. As you can see in this photo here, this, this particular plant is growing down and then about, what, four, five, six inches, it's hit a layer and it's gone vertical, or horizontal, excuse me. So no longer is it going down through that soil profile. It's not being able to tap into those uh, nutrients that water down in that, that the seven to eight to 12 inch depth. So it's being restricted from doing that. Uh, whereas you take this picture, and the other nice thing about this too, if you take a shovel, which is your most basic tool you need, and you get your spade full, that when you bring it up like that, it'll tend to fall apart where those compacted layers are. You can see this next picture I just showed, we have a compactor evidence of an old compacted layer, but those roots are growing nice and straight uh, through it. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing is roots ought to grow straight, but there ought to be uh, deep roots and there ought to be fibrous roots that are allowed to grow unrestricted. In this cotton plant, we're seeing the nice tap root, but we're also seeing the accumulation of some nice feeder roots that would be closer to the soil surface. What does color tell us about soil? Well, color is a good indicator of organic matter, soil organic matter. And what is organic matter? That's just previous plant material, biomass, whether it be the crop residue, whether it be a cover crop, uh, it includes the root system that grow on that, that, that dynamic that all occurs there. And the tan, again, the more organic matter you have, the darker the color of your so soils will be. Uh, as I said earlier, it tends to accumulate at the surface and work its way down through the soil profile. And it, what happens when you till the soil, there's a couple things we mentioned earlier, uh, is that you oxidize it, you mix that color, you tend to expose it to more bacterial uh, decomposition, if you will, and you, again, you lose that accumulating effect uh, of the organic matter. So it, it should be able, as your healthier soils or the soil begin to become healthier, you ought to start seeing uh, kind of a more distinct line between where the subsoil or the darker organic matter accumulation is and where uh, it goes down, uh, the subsoil begins. The other thing, I talked about roots earlier, they're really important because what they do uh, by creating this, uh, this uh, canopy, we think about a plant above the ground has, you got some plants that are various heights. Well, the same thing's happening below the ground with the root system. You have various depths, you have tap roots, you have fibrous roots, some roots grow deeper. But what the importance there, one, they add organic matter, but they also create pore space as it goes deeper into the soil profile. They uh, take advantage of pre-existing channels, if you will, uh, they're created by, say, earthworms, you know, so last year's earthworm hole becomes this year's uh, uh, cotton plant root path that it takes, and, and they, they exude, uh, uh, exudates along the inside of these channels, these uh, pore spaces, and they put out a carbon material down there. So they help move that carbon uh, down deeper in the soil profile and help open it up. So the roots are really a good indicator of how uh, healthy your soil is and how well it is functioning. You know, we talk a lot about soil biology. In fact, it's, it's not by uh, chance that whenever, you, a lot of times you see a picture of someone that is showing off how their healthy soil field, uh, you'll see earthworms. Well, that's really important because earthworms are the first indicator. That's something you can see. You ought to see a lot of them. You know, uh, any healthy, good, good healthy soil uh, field should have anywhere from a million and a half to two million earthworms. 
you know, what does that equate to? That's about five, six, seven, or eight per shovel full. Uh, in that time of the year, you'll see them. Now, you go out there in the middle of the winter, obviously, you're not going to see any earthworms, but you go out there this time of the year in the spring, uh, when those things are warming up, conditions are more suitable, you'll see a lot of earthworm activity. You'll see huts. You'll see little middens on the soil surfaces. You'll see uh, those types of indicators. You should also see uh, things such as mill, mill, millipedes or centipedes, pill bugs, springtails, and I mean, other assorted soil creatures. And why that's important is these are keystones. I mean, uh, by that I mean that it takes a lot of soil biology in the food web to, to support uh, uh, earthworm population or, or centipede population. It takes a lot of bacteria. It takes a lot of fungi. So if you have a lot of uh, visible soil bio, uh, biological critters, then you should, that's an indicator that your soil uh, food web, which drives nutrient and pest management, uh, should be pretty uh, functional. And then here's something else you might see. You might see it looks like cobwebs growing. That's a good thing. That's not, those aren't spider webs. Uh, what that is, in many cases, are fungal hyphae. Now, this one happens to be from uh, some saprophytic fungi. They're, they're helping to break down uh, that cord stalks there. Uh, and then those are the mycelium where these hyphae are kind of bunched together. Why that's important is it takes uh, fungal, you know, the saprophytic fungi, uh, fungi are really important to breaking down uh, these uh, high lignin residues such as corn stalks, uh, cereal rye, those types of things that, that have high carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, really important. So what that tells me uh, when I'm observing that, that I'm doing things to allow them to thrive. If you don't see this, that means you're probably doing, uh, creating a habitat where they can't support themselves and such things as tillage. Tillage is really detrimental to allowing uh, fungi to be able to establish themselves and thrive in your soils. And then if you look close enough, you might see a little earthworm egg. So again, all visible indicators of a robust soil food web, which the majority is, uh, you can't see unless you have a microscope uh, and some other sophisticated equipment. What's this guy doing? He's smelling his soil. What's that tell me? Well, your soil ought to have a sweet, earthy smell. I was, I was telling you the bacteria in there, they're releasing their metabolic processes as they're going through their life cycles or releasing that nice jasmine smell. That's to give you a good feeling of uh, euphoria, so to speak. But if your soil, soil doesn't have that, it smells like rotten eggs, it kind of got a, some kind of a metallic odor, that tells me that your soil has gone anaerobic on you. What's that mean? That means it's lacks at some point during the growing season, it's got lost its oxygen content. So those microbes that can thrive under lower oxygen tend to, to uh, can dominate the system at, the, at that point. What makes uh, soil have uh, go anaerobic? Well, you have poor aeration. That means you have too many microscopic pore spaces and not enough macro. Pores. That means the air doesn't get exchanged. You know, the pores are the lungs or the circulatory system. They allow water to infiltrate. When the water goes through there, you have airspace. And that's all the plants that we raise for food and fiber are plants that need to be, uh, have oxygen to survive. So again, the smell can be a good indicator of either good biological activity, have that nice earthy smell, or poor bi uh, biological activity. Soil temperature, that's one that we always used to hear when it was first started hearing about no-till. So our soils are uh, under no-till, they tend to they be more compacted, they are cool, wet in the spring, which is true because there's nothing in a system that's just 100% no-till with no cover crops or anything, any other the, of the other soil health management practices that would encourage good aeration of the soil. A healthy soil, again, as I've mentioned, has a, a, a dynamic, uh, pore space uh, system in it. it has macro pores big ones you know big as a pencil big as diameter as a pencil you think about getting big night crawler how big that is then they go down to micro pores and even that, that that even small fibrous roots can hardly get into but we need to have that variety and what happens in when you have that that diversity of pore spaces the water in a healthy field will tend to drain out as it moves down through the soil profile so we don't require a lot of energy, a lot of sunlight in the spring to remove or dry the soil out because it's already, it's not saturated. And so it warms up quicker. And the other thing is we tend to think about 
soils in the spring being cool, but also what's important is how cool they are in the summer. It's really important to maintain the soil depth, the temperature at about two inches in that below 95 degree range, because those organisms that are most beneficial for food and fiber production tend to thrive better. You know, microbes live under all sorts of, of conditions. You can go to the uh, to the hot springs down in Arkansas or out at Yellowstone National Park, and they they've got microbes that live in those. But those aren't the ones we want in our crop fields. So again, cooler is better, less than 95. And the other thing, it gets to the plant. The plant utilizes water better under cooler temperatures. When the temperature in the soil gets above 100, then the plant tends to have to go into survival mode. If we can keep it down in that 8, 95, or 90 range, then the plant can utilize that uh, water to make more plants. So it's really critical. This is kind of a fun one. This is soil stability. You know, this one you need to do a little preparation, but you know, grab a clot or two, put it on your dashboard, let it dry out, air dry, and then get your glass of water and you drop it in there. So why would you want to do that? Well, this is an indicator of how stable your water, your soil is going to be as related to holding together. Remember the first picture I showed, that field was saturated and then became crusted. That's because it had so poor soil stability. What's taking place? All these soil clods have holes in them. They got pore spaces. Water rushes in them pores and some soils fall apart because there's no internal uh, strength to hold it together. It takes, to, in order to have a stable aggregate, you need to have created the conditions where the sand, silt, and clay particles hold, are bound together by biotic glues that are created by soil organisms. Fungi, bacteria make these glues that bind things together and also involves the root, rooting system. So, so an aggregate is much more than just a combination of sand, silt, and clay. So if you, you put something in there, a clot in there, and it doesn't hold together or falls apart quickly, again, that, that, that you've created the conditions that don't encourage those microbes to bind the soil together. And also through soil disturbance, such as tillage, you tend to break it up. So again, uh, uh, break those soil particles apart. So again, you can kind of see, uh, you can tell a lot if you know what you're looking for. This is what good aggregates look like. You can see it looks like uh, chocolate cake crumbs uh, down in the left-hand uh, corner there. And then you can see the microscopic view. You can, looking under a microscope, you can see the big canyons of airspace or pores where water can move through on the one on the right. Stable soil aggregates are critical for soil and water infiltration, holding capacity through the uh, growing season, and they provide a place for nutrient cycling. And uh, the key here is you need a robust soil biology to improve aggregation to start to achieve all these benefits. So when you look at your field, you make an observation, the graded soils have these kind of characteristics. They tend to be very low in organic matter, you know, less than 1%, half percent. Again, that's not the norm. That's the way we've created it. There tends to be no residue on the surface. It tends to be some kind of compacted layer at that six, seven, eight inch uh, range in the soil profile. And as a result, <clears throat> these soils tend to have poor habitat for microbes. You won't see any macropores or macroarthropods such as earthworms, pill bugs, et cetera. And then the or microbial life, the microscopic ones, tend to be dominated by bacteria, which is not necessarily a good thing. And these systems are leaky. That means your nutrients either leak down, leach down throughout the uh, deeper in the soil profile where the roots can't get to them, or they leave the field into some, get into some kind of water body. And a healthy soil has higher organic matter, lots of residue on the surface. They got a, a wide diversity of macropores throughout the profile, not just at the surface, but down, you know, at eight, 10, 12 inches and so forth. Uh, they have a robust microbial life that's diverse, got a lot of fungi along with the bacteria that you can see evidence of. And then the result is you have this food web that's very active and you reap the benefits related to nutrient management, pest management, and so forth. So now that you made your, your diagnostic observations in your field and you need to think, okay, I need to make some changes. What can I do? Well, you need to think back to those four principles we talked about earlier in an earlier webinar. What can I do to minimize soil disturbance? What can I do to maximize diversity? What can I do to keep roots living throughout the year as much as possible? And we're going beyond just the crop root. And then 
we need to maximize the soil cover. How can we keep that residue out there? And all the activities that we do need to, to incorporate these principles as we design our system. So what is a soil health management system? It's a collection of conservation practices and or activities that focus on maintaining or enhancing soil health. You know, if you look at uh, NRCS has got 180 conservation practices. And I like to tease that any practice that requires the use of a bulldozer isn't a soil health enhancing practice. Things like terraces or waterways, oh, they control erosion, which is a good thing, but they don't do anything to enhance uh, your health of your soil on any particular square foot. So if you got a bulldozer, yeah, you're probably not going to improve the health of your soil. A system needs to contain uh, activities and practices that address all the soil health principles that I mentioned earlier. Is it helping me keep living roots growing? Is it helping me keep residue on the surface and so forth? And the third thing there is when they act together, it creates this synergistic effect. You know, NRCS has been real good at helping farmers install conservation practices one at a time. You know, and have money out there, that kind of uh, principle out there allows them to get funding to help install the practice or enticement. Uh, but the problem is by doing a one practice at a time, this year I do no-till, next year I do cover crop, we don't get that synergy that they do uh, provide to each other. And I'll talk more about that. And then the other thing, each soil health management system is cropping system specific. And by that, I mean what you do in North Carolina in a cotton field is going to be a little bit different than what they do in Texas or what they do in Georgia where they incorporate peanuts. So each system is going to be a little bit different, but it's going to basically have the same practices applied in a different fashion, and they're going to address all the soil health principles to get that synergistic effect. So. What, what are the core practices? Every system needs to have these incorporated somehow, somewhere in the rotation. No-till, and we're talking about a, a system where you have the highest quality no-till, and, and I'll define what that is here in a little bit. We also wanna talk about incorporating cover crops, both for looking at diversity and being strategic in how we use those cover crops. It's very important. And we wanna talk about a conservation crop rotation. How can we get more diversity? You know, was it by adding cover crops? Is it added by adding uh, additional cash crops? And maybe you haven't been adding corn in your rotation or soybeans. Very important. And then the last thing is prescribed grazing. There's a lot of interest out there in grazing these cover crops because we can put pounds on cows. That's just a fact of it. But how can we do that in such a way that it enhances the health of your soil rather than degrading it and just utilizing the resource out there, forage resource out there that you didn't have before. And I think the key here is we need to look at soil health. It's not a destination to say that we've arrived, it's a journey. And by that, I mean, every year is gonna be a little bit different. Every obstacle is gonna be different from year to year. And, and as you move through your journey, you need to learn and grow from that and apply it on more acres if possible. So it's a, not a destination, it's a journey. The second group of practices are those practices that increase soil health when they when they're applied in conjunction with those core practices I just mentioned. Things like nutrient management, pest management, and irrigation water management. They help enhance the benefits that you're getting from the no-till, the cover crops, and so forth. And it's really important to recognize, you know, how, how can that be? Well, nutrient management, we need to understand the impact that improper management of nutrients has on how your soil functions, such as that, you know, when you have soils that are very high in P because we put too much manure on it. That's a good, good example. What that does, that helps shut down some of those uh, symbiotic relationships of some of soil organisms in the soil so you don't get the benefit uh, uh, that you would if the P level in your soil was a little lower. Again, these add benefits. And then there's always going to be in the field will be those practices that are we call as applicable. Not every field has an open ditch or a, a, a button that needs a filter strip or a buffer or something along those lines just because they're physically not present. Uh, irrigation water management, not every field is irrigated. So these practices are site specific and they really address certain concerns that not every field would have. I like this, this picture is Dr. Bill Robertson. 
down in Arkansas and he's, he's showing a, a, what we call a furrow runner. This is an interesting one because this, this producer has improved the health and function of his soil so well, he's having trouble getting water. It's infiltration on his field has increased so much, he's having trouble uh, getting water from one end to the other when they do surface irrigation. And this tool kind of smears, creates a little channel, helps to aid in that. Again, not every field will need that type of, of assistance. And then, and then there's a whole new array of new technology. I guess we'd be a little arrogant to think that we've got it all figured out. Things that, that we don't know about, or maybe you're on the verge of learning, or it's not in any kind of practice standard. But again, they improve soil health. This would be something like a controlled traffic pattern. You know, wherever a tire goes over uh, soil, you have the potential to have compaction created, especially if you repeat that over and over. You know, controlling the traffic, you know, I, I challenge you to go out and dig a hole where your tire is gone and then maybe between the rows where it hasn't, you know, you'll see a difference. You'll be able to make these visible observations I've talked about. Precision application and nutrients and pesticides and so forth, use of flotation tires. These are all things and, and other things will be coming down the pipe. So there's a whole new array of things that, that hopefully we'll be seeing uh, uh, down the road. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about quality, you know, because uh, when we first started no-tailing, I can remember uh, that the quality no-till, we didn't really know what it was. You know, what's the goal of any planter, any, whether you're planting cotton, peanuts, corn, whatever, the idea is to get the seed placed in the soil at the same depth so they emerge at the same time, so they grow through their life cycle at the same period and mature at the same time. So it's, it's all about timing and ensuring uh, quality control. Well, how do we do that? Well, when you're planting in the residue as heavy as this cover crop mix, you need to make sure your, your planter's got sharp edges. And what do I mean by that? That means these cultures have good sharp edges on it, that the row cleaners are adjusted so that you're just moving the residue out of the way and you're not causing, uh, uh, creating a furrow for the water to pond in. That the double disc openers are sharp and, and, and set appropriately. And we don't have any bearings out on our closing devices. So again, those are just common, there's nothing new about that. I mean, that's something every planter should have, whether you're planting conventional or no-till, but it's really critical in no-till situations. You might need to slow down a little bit. You know, you need to account for that depth of residue uh, when you're uh, planting. You know, if you've got six inches of residue and you squish it down there, you know, maybe if you want to get a good two-inch seed, you might have to adjust your planter depth a little bit. Again, that's the goal ensure good seed to soil contact so you can get uniformity, emergence, and so forth. The other thing is we need to think about terminating the cover crop. You know, we need to put that in our, you know, we'll talk about planting it, but terminating it is just as important, especially when it comes to planting time. Uh, we need to make sure to roll it down. This picture of the use of the roller crimper. Hopefully some of you have seen this, and basically this, this tool uh, rolls the cover crop down, and while it's doing that, it's crimping it. You know, why is that important? Well, it, it does several things. It, it helps just, it can be a pest management strategy. Some fields, uh, especially under some sandy conditions, might have problems with uh, moles and voles and other small mammals going in to eat the seed. You know, by rolling the cover crop down, it allows for that predator, you got a hawk or something like that, can actually see, see the critter and get down and, and help keep them under control. So it's kind of a pest strategy there. Uh, helps uh, when it comes to planting. If you roll it, it's easier to plant. If the residue is in the uh, knocked down in the same direction that you're planting, your your openers can go and and get in the ground easier. And the other, the last thing there, it accelerates residue breakdown. Where once if you have a you know microbes can't jump a foot, you know with, with, so if the, the residue is in touch of the soil, it helps for them to be incorporated. You get that that the, the mic, uh, arthropods will help bring that into the soil surface. And, and help stimulate that nutrient cycle and so forth. Um, it's key here, you don't necessarily need a, a fancy tool like this roller crimper. You can use an old, like this, a, a cold packer. You can see that residue is what, six, seven foot tall. That's good stuff right there. It's being terminated later. Uh, or something, even this Ray Steyer north of Greensboro here where I'm at. He's this old cold packer here for 30 or 40 years knocking his cover down. So it doesn't have to be a sophisticated piece of equipment, but the key is to help get it down so you can plant and, and receive all these other benefits. Talk a little bit about planting green. What is that? That, that is an entomologist nightmare is what that is. You hear a lot of entomologists talk about that. This is you know, job security for the future. 
and but farmers are finding that they can do that you know and there are some benefits to that you know what, what it is it, it's planting into a living cover crop something that you haven't sprayed you haven't terminated yet you know the key here is to do it as soon as possible after you've knocked it down don't wait three four five days because what happens is that residue will start to be uh, get a little spongy get a little springy and it's difficult to cut even though you might have your planter set up correctly so the key here is to do it as soon as possible to delay uh, problems so why would i want to leave my cover up like that well you need to watch the residue or the weather you know you can manage moisture in such a way uh, a lot of rains coming across uh, arkansas mississippi um, uh, georgia this spring uh, their fields are wet so if you're watching the weather you have a living crop growing out there helps to dry that field out a little bit but again you want to make sure you to be attentive because you don't want to dry that field out too much you know this is an excellent picture you can kind of see uh, nice seed placement you can see how thick that residue is uh, the sharp cultures are cutting right through that so there's no problem again making sure you manage it properly so if you don't like that you want to let it burn down you got to let it wait seven eight ten days let that residue get a little crispy and you should be able to cut through it again if your prior set uh, set up properly and uh, get a nice seed to soil contact and help to eliminate uh, problems along that line. The key here though, or one of the major issues you might wanna think about what happens if you terminate it and then we get all these rains. So you really gotta kinda watch your weather and make your decision uh, based on, on what the forecast is. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how adaptive nutrient management, how important that is. Again, it's understanding the impact on the uh, nutrient cycle. Uh, this picture is somebody's knifing in some liquid manure, which is a good thing we think about, but, get, but what rate are you applying it at? You know, if you tend to apply manure at the rate where you're trying to accommodate for your nitrogen management, you're gonna way over apply it for phosphorus. Phosphorus sticks around a lot longer in the soil. It disrupts those uh, uh, cycles I mentioned earlier, uh, where you have, uh, such organisms of biscular mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that you know, live within the roots uh, and then they go out and their hyphae go out and bring phosphorus in and, and zinc and water and those types of things. Well, if your P level is too high, that gets discouraged. So again, think about that and how, how it affects that. The other thing, we need to understand that degraded soils have a horrible impact on nutrient cycles. They tend to shut them down. You know, we're all familiar with denitrification that occurs when the soils get saturated and it goes anaerobic. I mentioned that earlier a little bit, and you can lose, you know, 10, 15, 20% of the nitrogen applied can just get volatilized and lost into the atmosphere. Or the opposite can occur. You can get it to leach down out of the soil profile, uh, maybe into some kind of field tiles and loss into a drainage system. Both of them are not good situations. Both of them are not good situations. So again, degraded soils have a tremendous impact on nitro or our nutrient cycles uh, beyond what, what we recognize and plan for. And, and this is one reason we think about uh, the effect of uh, tillage on microbial activity. We go in, we do an early year tillage, we slice and dice that surface residue up and biological activity just gets really stimulated. That's all bacterial driven. And you'll get this spike in activity generally when you which is measured by you met respiration uh, you know microbes are during work so they release a lot of co2 but that happens early in the year and you also get that spike in activity spike and release of nutrients that might be available and then it comes back down so what's happening we're getting that nutrient release from your residue in a time of the year when the plant's really not needing all that much well, you compare that to a system where you're doing no-till, you get a more even distribution of respiration. You actually probably get, you'd have a more diverse uh, res, you know, organism there, so you'd have it coming from fungi and bacteria and so forth compared to the convention of till. So the same volume of respiration might be occurring, but the release of those nutrients over time will be more beneficial on a no-till system than they would be in a, in a um, conventional till system. So let's talk about cover crops. I really heard uh, uh, Klaus Martin did a webinar I heard several months ago 
Uh, he's a producer up in New York, and he talks about cover crops should complement the following crop. So they should be cover cropping with a purpose. You know, we tend to be fad driven when we select our cover crops, and the most most recent one would be the radishes. They tend to be uh, something that, that are popular, uh, but that doesn't mean every time you uh, plant a cover crop, you need a radish in there. So let's think about that in the context of cotton. You know, what what plants should we plant either a cover, a, that would benefit the cotton crop to be planted into it, and what what would benefit the following crop after you harvest the cotton? They're the most, both uh, scenarios are out there. So what benefits can we derive for cover crops that cotton would benefit from? One being pigweed, you know, weed control, pigweed. You know, we're talking high levels of residue. Uh, Dr. Stanley Culpepper in the uh, University of Georgia has done a lot of work, demonstrates that if we can get biomass up there, we can control weeds. You know, whether it's through the shading or the allopathic effect of rice or rye, that type of thing, that's a good thing. We can get some benefits to cotton from moisture management, whether we increase the availability, we got more water getting in the ground, uh, we lower the evaporation rates, we got cooler temperatures, all important for moisture management. Talked a little bit ago about the robust nutrient cycle, you know, nitrogen availability. You know, is there a cover crop that we can plant that would help us get our 90 or 100 pounds of nitrogen that available? And then uh, really a key here is how can we create a uh, more intensive mycorrhizal relationship, which is good for water intake and nutrient exchange. You know, all of the crops we raise, cotton, peanuts, soybeans, all benefit from uh, mycorrhizal relationships. So having that that infected soil, so to speak, or roots in the soil is a good thing. So we need to understand how cover crops affect each of these. And particularly important is this idea of carbon to nitrogen ratio. The plants that have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, such as cereal rye, wheat straw, 80, 80 to two to one, those are pretty high. What that does uh, that tends to tie up nitrogen because in order to break that down, those microbes need a lot of, you know, a lot of nitrogen. Uh, a soil microbe, you can see here, uh, it has a carbon and nitrogen ratio, you know, eight to one. So in order to break that down, uh, it's going to need 10 units of nitrogen to break down that rye straw, the wheat straw. So it's going to take a long time for that to, so you need to consider that when you're planting, using a cereal rye uh, as a cover crop, is that going to tie up the nitrogen from the following crop? And the other side of it would be the legumes. They have a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. They're going to not uh, decompose very quickly. They're going to release their nutrients quicker. So again, if you're going to plant a crop uh, to take advantage of those nutrients, such as nitrogen and so forth, you need to think about that rather than uh, such as soybeans don't, don't benefit from nitrogen because they produce their own. So that wouldn't necessarily be a good thing uh, to follow uh, uh, soybeans into a crimson clover cover crop, whereas you'd be uh, cotton would be a much better choice. So let's think about this in the context if your goal is to do weed control, uh, mentioned the pigweed, high carbon biomass, you need to get uh, cereal rail, rye is great. You need to get, let it grow, you let it grow. You need 8,000 pounds or more and you need to roll it down to keep it in contact with the soil. It's really important. That's that's all about timing. You know, the difference between uh, the stand is the same. You've got the same number of plants per square foot. It's really the amount of timing uh, by delaying termination in the spring to get that go from 3,000 pounds to 6,000 pounds could be two weeks delay. And it's having the patience and understanding the benefits that you're going to derive that you can uh, by allowing it to do that. Let's talk about legumes. You know, we can get a lot of nitrogen from this nice stand. There's some Christian clover. There's some hairy vetch. Uh, they got their, they're all being uh, supported by that, that cereal rye. This is really a, a really nice uh, picture of a, a mixed cover crop. And uh, the, the rye kind of provides that trellis effect that allows the, the vetch and the, and the uh, Christian clover to grow up long. And uh, just a tremendous thing. Uh, it helps benefit it when you go to terminate that. When I talked about rolling it, one of the things that rye does in a mix like this, it helps to hold it down because the uh, clovers will be intermingled with that rye stalk uh, very tightly. 
and again, you help hold it down. Again, that helps with the release of the nutrients because it comes in contact with the soil and the microbes can get it. Uh, and these crops tend to be a little uh, harbor less disease and pathogens uh, than others. What's well, always important, <clears throat> excuse me, make sure you have your uh, cover crop inoculated in order to get the uh, nodulation like that. It's really important. And this again, about timing, and especially related to cover crops with leggings. And this is a tool that you can go uh, to the University of Georgia, has this cover crop, a nitrogen availability calculator. You can Google that. Actually, I think you can send it. There's instructions on taking a cover crop sample. They'll do an analysis to tell you uh, how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is going to become available through the growing season. But just to illustrate my point, this is a couple weeks difference. Difference between 7,000 pounds and 3,500 pounds is about 30 pounds of nitrogen becoming available to the plant. This is all about management, allowing that cover crop to grow a little bit later in the growing season, allowing that, that clover to blossom a little bit. You don't want to like let it go full bloom because uh, once the clover goes full bloom, then, it's, then, then it, the nitrogen content goes down a little bit. But allowing it to grow two, three weeks in the fall and in, in the spring is critical. And then talking about it for, for grazing purposes, you know, it's really important just, you know, you select your cover crop mix would have some grasses in it, uh, you know, clovers and peas, something real similar to what you would use uh, if you were to uh, graze, graze your livestock permanently, you know. And the, the key here is this is not a, uh, just turn the cows loose and forget about them. You know, if we can measure the amount of biomass out there, that's pretty easy. Uh, there's tools out there. You can measure the height and, you know, when it gets up there, you can do some estimates of how much uh, vegetation there is. And you can calculate how many cows can be turned out on an acre there, whether you've got enough biomass for 20 cows or 40 cows or what have you. There should be some thought process put into that, you know, because the key here is to try and keep those cows bunched up together to allow them to trample and eat and urinate and manure and all that kind of good stuff but we don't want to take it all the way down to bare earth. And then that's kind of a, an art. And, they, and the other thing is take advantage of the summer. You know, in the South, we have a lot of growing degree days after ha corn harvest, if you have corn in the rotation, consider using a summer cover crop. Uh, if you're going to plant wheat in the fall, you got a 60, 80 day window there that allows a lot of biomass to be produced. You can make some phenomenal chain gains in soil health there. Or if you don't plant wheat, you're going to follow your corn with cotton or something like that. You can uh, go ahead and throw in a summer cover crop mix along with your winter cover crop mix. Uh, the winter uh, should take out your your uh, winter your summer uh, cover, such as your uh, sun hemp and those types of things. They'll freeze out and uh, allow your legumes and, and cereal rye to continue on through the winter. So. We kind of got a few minutes here. Let's talk about some challenges. You know, uh, the biggest challenge I always hear, yield drag. You know, I adopted no-till, I adopted your system, and my yields went down. So I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, let's think about why that might have occurred. Here we have a, a situation that's planting into some really heavy rye residue there. You know, previous crop had a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. Think about that. And again, talking about the microbes. They're trying to break that down to release that nitrogen back into the nutrient cycle. Well, if you have a high CN ratio, we have low car or nitrogen, or we don't accommodate for that, we may actually have to add a little nitrogen the first year or two to help feed the biology, so to speak, to help break that down. So again, that could be the result of why you have a yield drag on your cotton or your corn or something like that, just because of your use of a high uh, carbon nitrogen ratio cover followed by a high carbon to nitrogen um, or a high nitrogen using crop. Let's talk again, yield drag, slower decomposition and release of nutrients. It's the same principle. We haven't put it in contact with the soil. We got large pieces of residue out there that we, ha we haven't had before. But the big thing is we haven't had the microbial community. You know, last year we were conventional. This year we're moving into a, a soil health management system. It doesn't happen overnight, folks. We need to accommodate 
and think about the time it takes to allow those microbes to start to regenerate themselves a little bit. Uh, they don't have, we don't, haven't created the uh, situation where the predators can, might be there. We're creating a habitat for them. It takes a little bit for them to come back. You know, we don't have the protozoa population, so to speak, uh, that can consume the bacteria that helps drive that mineralization cycle. Again, it's key to roll it down, help it come into contact. And the, again, the yield drag is usually caused because we don't have a robust food web established yet. Predators haven't come back, bacterially dominated. We need to have patience and let it come back. It will come back, but it's not gonna happen the first year. Other challenges, we're dealing with compaction that I talked about, you inherited it, you have a, a compacted layer, you got lack of pore space, micropores especially, this picture I showed earlier, what can you do? Well, you need, if you know you got compaction or you suspect you have compaction, make sure you put some kind of deep rooted cover crop in your mix. You know, don't just go with a uh, cereal rye or wheat or something like that. You know, make sure you have some radishes, make sure you have some rapeseed. Those are really good. Uh, any kind of brassica is really good at helping to break up that uh, hard pan and poke holes through that uh, system, help to get that carbon down into the soil profile. So it helps to ease up on that compaction there. So you can have continuous pore space year in and year out. You need to plan for that. So where do we begin? You know, talk to all about that. It was, you know, there's some steps we can take. Well, let me, let me throw an idea out there. Think about soybeans. Now, why would I say plant soybeans? Let's don't begin with cotton, you know. Let's begin with soybeans. Well, why is that? Well, soybeans are really a low input crop. We, we don't really need to add additional fertilizer. If, you're, if your soil tests are up pretty good, they can take advantage of that. Uh, they do well in high carbon cover crops, such as cereal rye. Uh, or something like that. Why is that? Well, because they produce their own nitrogen. Uh, they're not uh, as reliant on what's going to be uh, mineralized uh, over the summer as uh, other crops like a corn or, or cotton that is a big nutrient hog uh, might be. They do well uh, by benefiting from the wheat control and the late season uh, rainfall events that might come help with that fill out the uh, pod, fill out the bean seed, that type of thing. So it's, a, it's just a really good crop. And then the last thing is we know an awful lot about no-tilling soybeans in the cover crop. And we've been doing that in agriculture since, the, you know, the 90s. You know, we're drilling beans, whether you use a split row planter or whatever. We know a lot about, there's a lot of varietal information. It's just an easy crop to begin. And by starting here, what that does, it allows your soil to rejuvenate for a year. It gives it that chance to start to establish the habitat, allows those microbes to become familiar with your field again, allows those predator to prey to prey relationships to begin to be reestablished. So it's pretty important uh, to, and then, and then what you do is you reap the benefits by allowing that to take place. So, soil health management systems are a collection of activities and practices that address all of the soil health management. Uh, principles. You want to make sure your system uh, is one that minimizes soil disturbance, you know, reduces tillage, uh, reduces the uh, impact of, um, of nutrients uh, and chemical chemicals on the soil itself. We want to be able to maximize diversity. You know, we think about maximizing diversity. We can do that through the inclusion of uh, cover crops, multi-species cover crops adding other row crops or cash crops into the rotation. Uh, we wanna make sure we got roots growing in the soil as much as possible. Uh, just, uh, I just can't overemphasize that one much because it's, that it's the plant that takes the sun through photosynthesis and feeds the biology through the roots into the soil. Uh, just really a critical component of that. And then the last thing, we wanna make sure our soil health management system helps us maintain soil cover as long as possible. And I guess I kind of left out a little bit. To, you, know, you can manage your cover crop mix by having that, that. That's why they're so important to have some legumes that have a high CN or a low CN, have some cereal grains that have some high CN, 
by kind of merging those together, you can manage how quickly over time that that uh, residue will decompose. So if you're going for long term versus short term uh, residue cover and the benefits it provides. And with that, Camille, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you for contributing your expertise for this episode of the Healthy Soils for Sustainable Cotton webinar series. Um, if anyone has questions for Mr. Lamb or uh, questions about what was covered in this episode, you can contact us at info at soilhealthinstitute.org. And we would be happy to connect you with Mr. Lamb for, uh, to get you some answers to those questions. So thank you all for tuning in and we hope you join us next time.